Right, uh, this is um, going to be a, a normal uh, cut down one to what I normally do because it, um, it does go on. So this will be the first part and if it's successful they might invite me back to finish the second part which I'll take you up to the modern day where I can explain what's going off at the colliery site now and the future that we're going to have out there. As you said, my name is Jim Davis. I, was, uh, I went to bed Sanger as a minor from leaving the school in 57. And I was there right till the very end, and um, I was actually the last miner in Kent because I was uh, um, supervising when they actually filled the hole in, and I finished in March 1990. So it was, uh, it's a place, dear place in my heart. Um, this uh, is talk, it's uh, like it said, it's called Invicta Miners. Part one, mainly based on Deal and Ben Sanger because I normally give a talk around Kent, but just don't concentrate on these areas, it's uh, more where they are. In 1846, the first suggestion that coal measures could be found in Kent. They'd um, been mining coal in Belgium and uh, the Pardee Cali coal fields since the Middle Ages. In fact, that little area there supplied all of Europe with coal at one time. So they thought that there could be coal in, the, um, in this part of the UK and you can see that uh, the French coal measures are there and then Kent there so that they knew that there could be a coal in that particular area. Now there was a chap called Arthur Burr who um, bought all the concessions up and they thought he was a saviour, he was given freedom of Dover and God knows what but he turned out to be a bit of a, a fiddler which I'll explain to you. Um, as it, it goes on. At that time, when he got involved, they'd just stopped digging the Channel Tunnel because they was feared of a French invasion. And so the government had stopped them. They'd got about 2,000 yards in or something like that. The engineer, a chap called Brady, they um, persuaded him to turn one of the boring machines on its head and drill down and look for coal. And the um, 1886, they sunk the first borehole at the base of um, Shakespeare Cliff in Dover. Coal measures were found at a thousand feet, so they knew that coal was in this area of Kent. 1896, they started to sink what they called the Dover Colliery or the Shakespeare Colliery. They, um, these, um, come on, start this. <laughs> Modern technology, it should be kicking in at the moment, it's not doing it. But, um, sorry? Not a little cold. I know, that's it. But, um, the, uh, as I say, they, um, they started sinking these um, shafts at uh, Shakespeare, and it was uh, sh shaft sinking by the sinkers is a very, very dangerous job. And they, uh, yeah, we missed that one, it's all right, it didn't kick in. But um, when they were sinking the shafts, there was, uh, at one stage, there was eight men killed. They were drowned because water had uh, broken in. Now, this shows you the close proximity to um, the Shakespeare Tunnel, where the trains come out of. A large number of boreholes were sunk all over Kent just to see what um, the situation was as regards coal. Now, they sunk all these boreholes all round this part of East Kent. So you can see it was peppered. And they found that there was nearly 10 billion, not million, 10 billion tons of workable seams in the East Kent area. And that didn't count the coal that went under the sea towards the Pardee Cali. And during our lifetime that the coal coalfield worked, we've only mined about 100 million tons so you can see how much coal is still underground there. Not only did they find coal, but they found 200 million tonnes of iron ore in the Dover area. With the results of the boreholes, they decided to have 18 collieries in Kent. Now this area, that we only ended up with, uh, well we ended up with four really, but these were the collieries that were going to be sunk in Kent, so you can see that it was going to be quite um, a big area. They had Shakespeare to start with, Snowdown, Tilmanston, Chislet, and finally Betsanger. Now, Shakespeare never produced any coal. Arthur Burr, what he did, 
he wanted people to invest in this. So he what we call salted the um, Shakespeare pit. That's he put a load of coal wagons down the night before. Next day he got all the press there and they brought them up and it, oh, he sold millions of shares because they all thought it was going to be just like um, up towards the Midlands and that, there were going to be loads and loads of coal there. So that hell of a lot of people invested and lost money in the Kent coal field. The uh, Kent coal turned out to be a very good coking coal. That uh, right up until we um, finished uh, producing coal, one tonne of Kent coal mixed with nine tonne of, say, Nottingham or Yorkshire coal made a very good coking coal. And that's why it's um, Dorman Long, who was a steel making company, they took an interest and they actually bought the mineral rights to Betsanga off Lord Northbourne. They bought Snowdown Colony for a pound because it had already been going but then it had been closed. And they all had an interest in uh, what we would call Woodensbrook Colliery, which never actually got off the ground. But they, Snowdown and um, Betsanga actually did. With a lack of experienced miners in this area at the time, they had to be recruited from all parts of the country because there wasn't many, you could say local, well there were no local miners at all. They came from Scotland, North East, Ireland, Lancashire, Yorkshire, Notts, Midlands, Wales and Somerset. So all of these um, chaps came from all over the country to this little area, and each um, one, like uh, we can say Chiseler, was mainly a Welsh kit because that was um, owned by a firm called Powell Dufferin. Originally, it was owned by a German company, but they were interned during the First World War, so they had to um, relinquish their rights, and a Welsh company took it over. Tilmanston was a lot of Somerset men, and Betsanger and Snowdown had more or less, you know. Uh, whatever was left. Who were these men? Well, the First World War was over and they'd gone back to their um, place, um, to a home fit for heroes. And uh, of course, when they got there, there was unemployment. Thank you very much. There was only unemployment and uh, really down and out. And a lot of them had been tunneling in the First World War. When they joined the Colours, they found out that they were miners. So, they um, got them tunnelling and uh, they, well, a lot of them said it was better than being in the trenches because uh, they were dry, but the Germans were doing the same thing and tunnelling towards them to put explosives under. Well, these chaps who did survive, they went back to their valleys, to their industrial areas, but they were thrown on the scrap heap. So they was out of a job. There was a recession on up there, they couldn't sell the coal, but they could sell the Kent coal because it was um, close proximity to London and the continent. They had a ready-made market. Why did they come to this corner of the UK? One time, mining was the valley's only industry. When Britain was unable to sell coal abroad, there was not enough work to keep the Ronda pits open. So large numbers became unemployed. Poverty hit the miners and their families. For years there seemed no hope of building any kind of life in the valley. Many left and began life again in new jobs away from the old mining. My, uh, my father was part of that uh, from Wales where they came down here in the 30s, so was my colleague Jim, his family were. And uh, it was repeated all over the place. They were the uh, people that come into the area looking for work. How did they get here? Because they had no money. They didn't, uh, couldn't be able to afford uh, a train fare or things like this. And um, this particular chap, who was actually my next door neighbour, he explains. Here's the books. I put his gloves on, big gloves. I walked through London in the big gloves until they got my big van. And then the policeman pulled us up and asked if we were going and what they've got in the skates. So about 12 o'clock at night, we had to open the cases on the big bench until the police got us out in. They were scoundrels when we told them we'd walk from Yorkshire and went again. They went down to the police. 
See, now he's explaining how um, he came from a place called Diddington um, down to Kent to get a, a job. Now, he walked, some came by bike. Um, a lot of Geordies came from uh, Newcastle and came to Chatham and then walked to either any of the pits around here. So by all sorts of means, they came into this, um, this little corner of the UK. Now, with the prospects of jobs and better housing, overnight, East Kent became a boom area. And these people were bringing with them their communities, traders, churches, the sports. They all came into this, uh, within a few years, this place had exploded with all these um, people coming into the area. The planned manpower, like I said, this is the 1925 report, the planned manpower with 18 pits was going to be 40, 147,000 miners, that's miners, not families, miners, and it still works because I told you about the um, iron ore they found, there was going to be 48,000 steel workers as well. So. It was going to be very, well, <laughs> very close, but there was a hell of a lot of hostilities locally, particularly in Deal, of these um, people coming into the area because originally the sinkers, who were mainly Irish navvies, they were a rare breed. They were banned from every pub within six miles of Betsanga when they were sinking. And uh, the locals thought, God, if these are like with just these men that are doing their sinking, what's it going to be like when everyone else comes? So there was a hell of a lot of hostility. Um, this is uh, Percy Davis, who was the mayor at the time. And um, I've taken these out of uh, council records. And he said, asked every member of the council to vote against the people for providing houses for these people coming into the area. This is uh, what I researched from the local Mercury, where it's got, um, th this happened right up until the late 30s, nearly 40s, where they had a flat to let, no children or minors, not suitable for minors. And uh, it, nearly every advert mentioned that they didn't want to have minors, so that's um, what they expected. There was unknown community of the minors, which southerners were rather <coughs> What are these northern people going to come and take over? And they prevented these people coming here and in fact getting on our seafront, taking our places. I, as a schoolgirl, was told, oh, well, you mustn't go up in the area where they live. There'll be bad language spoken, this sort of thing. This was a, a wrong view entirely. I mean, I don't agree with it at all, but this was the feeling of so many of these people who considered themselves the upper class in those days of so much class distinction. So you can see this, um, this was the sort of thing that, uh, to expect when the chaps come. Now this particular gentleman here, I knew quite well, his name was um, Billy Marshall. He was the first Labour councillor on Deal Council. And uh, he was a lone voice and he pioneered and pioneered to get uh, Mill Hill, the community up Mill Hill. And I find it sad that um, all the people that uh, voted against, they've all had roads named after them up there, but the poor old Bill, has not got anything uh, named after it at all, but I think we'll end up with something. But Billy was, um, he was the trade union leader. The first came into camp with the sinkers, who were migrant workers, uh, who used to sort of bivouac out near the pit. And they were a very hard group of men, as you can understand, with a job which in fact did take a heavy toll in life and live. And, uh, they had a certain tendency towards uh, drink and sort of biting and generally sort of hard living. Uh, they'd sink a cult and then move on to the next. And so the um, quiet little fishing town of Deal was suddenly confronted with these uh, uh, outsiders. And uh, this to some extent carried on when the miners came from the other coal fields into Kent to actually man up the pits. And, uh, it was really a system virtually of a social apartheid. Uh, there's many stories, even up until after the Second World War, where people would try to get lodgings, and once it was discovered that there was a miner involved, then they'd be told they weren't available. And one old friend of mine actually brought me a newspaper which he kept, and he showed me this little advert and it said, lodgings to let, 
minors need not apply. And uh, there's stories of pubs, for instance, where no dogs or minors allowed. And I think that that uh, has created a certain resentment amongst the community uh, that, uh, that they've been treated in this way. And one of the offshoots of that was that, uh, particularly when uh, you had the development like Elsham, with a pit village, with people coming in from many different areas, from Scotland, from Yorkshire, from many different areas, uh, ostracised by the local community, that they, they turned inwards and created a community life because there was very little to offer on the outside. But it was the miners that really introduced any culture into East Kent because if you look around, you'll find that the brass bands and the silver bands and the uh, horticultural societies and a lot of the cultural life of the area actually originated with the miners. And if you look at the clubs in the area, you'll still often find it's the miners which are the sort of man the committees and in fact are the stalwarts that are keeping a lot of community life going. My first Saturday evening in Deal, uh, I saw two of them stripped to the waist, fighting bare fist in, in the churchyard, in St. George's churchyard. And that, that, that horrified me. If he did that to me, what would he do to the, uh, to the native? That's, uh, that's Billy I was telling you about. Um, he was quite a character, and uh, he was telling it as it was in that particular time. Now, this... With the um, 1925 report, this was um, Sir Patrick's Abercrombie proposed new towns. And you can see where the dwellings, there was going to be 8,000 at uh, Chislet, 13 at Littlebourne, Wingham, 27, 5,000, because that was going to serve a number of pits. Um, Ham, 36, Woodsborough, 12,000, Nonington. But uh, the biggest shock of all was when I was giving the talk at St Margaret's and they found that they were going to end up with 20,000 miners <laughs> living there, which... Uh, didn't go down very well. But anyway, this didn't come to fruition, so uh, that is what was actually pro uh, proposed. Now this is the bloke, he's uh, Sir Patrick Abercrombie, a very, very well-known planner. In fact, he rebuilt London after the Blitz. But in 1925, he came, and uh, because this was going to be a really big thing, because Neville Chamberlain actually gave uh, an address at um, Canterbury Cathedral explaining that um, not for the people to be worried because it was going to become a new black country here but uh, he had great vision this chap he um, knew where the miners came from and what their conditions were like when they um, went and uh, they came from them sort of things these was huts this should be a film that's running but it's not for some reason but um, he did not want the collieries uh, the housing built on top of the collieries where you rolled out of bed and you went st straight down the pit like this here. He wanted the, um, the townships to be away from the colliery, like you had Elsham, which was about three mile away from uh, Snowdown Colliery, Hurston, about a mile from Chislet, um, Tilmanston at Elwington, which was about a mile, and then uh, Mill Hill, which is, uh, you can say, three miles. So he, he wanted the workplace away from the collieries. Now, with all these um, miners coming in, they brought their children with them. And they uh, all came with different dialects. Now, you can imagine, in fact, uh, my sisters, they still had a Welsh, uh, although born in Wales, they still had a Welsh dialect when they, uh, when they were quite old. So they all, they all kept it. At the colliery at that time, there was a wide and very diversity of dialects. There's a large proportion of Scots, some Welsh people, Derbyshire, uh, one family of Cornish people, I think, uh, Lancastrians. So that the children, when I first came here, were the sons and daughters of the original settlers, as it were. And so we had a rich diversity of accents in the classroom. I think the greatest difficulty we had in understanding uh, was entirely the Scots. <laughs> no, I think the tr trouble was with them who was brought up in Scotland, most of them was born down here, but them who were born in Scotland when they came down here and went into the sweet shop, it was a terrible job, you know. So the shop 
you got to understand what the Buddha wanted. So what happened? Uh, and uh, he used to come home crying. He didn't know what I want, but... <laughs> Uh, if the kid is going to play at any time, you could, when they come home, in for a tea or bad time, you can always tell whose who kid is they were playing with, you know, the Blanks and Yorkshire and Welsh, and the kid is used to copy one another. It was very embarrassing when you went in, you know. Oops, I didn't, didn't stop it there. It, uh, it went on a bit there, but um, it uh, was just uh, explaining how, and uh, that was Huey, who was uh, one of the, well, one of the chaps I first worked with, he was on back then, but he came down as a youngster, and he still had a broad Scottish accent, and he was saying what it was like then. But on the um, thing that I was going to show there, the film had run, um, there's, uh, the children were in the shop, and it was a, a well-known shop adjacent to the colliery called Jones's. And uh, if you were getting to work a little bit late, then you... Uh, You'd go in there and ask them to make you a sandwich for your what we call snack time, the lunch break. And on there, and you can see it, is a bacon slicer where they used to slice the ham up. But before they sliced the ham up, they had to kick the cat off it because that's where the cat slept. And I'll tell you, what, am I right, Les? You're in here somewhere. That bloody good ham sandwiches they were. <laughs> At first, the, there was no pinhead bars, and all these men used to come home from the pit, they couldn't get on public transport, so they used to ride home in coal lorries, bikes, walk, anything. They, they weren't welcome in pubs to get a drink, so that's how they used to come home. And uh, you can imagine these chaps walking towards you when they're all um, in their, what we term as in their pit black. In fact, uh, there's a, a tale that's told, the two old ladies who came from somewhere like Croydon, and they used to come to deal for a holiday. And uh, when they got back home, someone said to them, where have you been? They said, oh, we've been to Deal. What? Oh, it's a lovely little seaside town. It's beautiful down there. But I've never seen so many chimney sweeps in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so what the chaps used to do, they used to come home and uh, they used to have to bath in front of the fire with, um, well, the wife uh, helping them to fill the bath out. That's okay when it's the... Uh, the husband, but some of them had as many as six or eight sons. So you can imagine the last one there, he'd end up blacker than what um, he was, because uh, they were. But uh, the miners' welfare, they built, had money stopped, a penny a ton um, was taken off their wages, and they built the uh, canteen and the pithead bars, which was um, really, really fantastic. You know, when you come up the pit, and then you can, um, you can have a bath. It's, uh, it's really, really good. This is another film that's not run, but this is just showing you what um, I always thought was uh, quite comical. When um, the men, when you come up the pit, you didn't wash your own back, because you could get to it, because you were black from head to toe. So the person next to you washed your back, and you can have a line of men, about a dozen of them, all washing one another's back. And uh, I did have a film there, but it's not, uh, it's not running at the moment. As the workforce grew, buses were introduced. And um, they used to run to each of the collieries, because like I said, that they were a little bit far away from the collieries. Um, in Deal, we had um, a bloke called Harry Tomset, who used to deliver coal. And then... He used to deliver it in that bus, and that company is still going today, because um, he was, uh, well, they used to run all the pit buses. This is about 1937, when they're all lined up, because in 37 you had uh, nearly 3,000 men working at Betsanger alone, so you can imagine the logistics of getting um, these people home and away and whatnot. Now, with an annual estimated output of 13 million tonnes, a seaport had to be uh, established. They considered seven, but um, Dover was the first one, then Deal, and then Ridgeborough. Now you would straight away think Dover's the best place, but with Dover, you've got um, a very short distance between the cliffs and the sea, so there's no room for marshalling yards, because we're talking about 13 million tonne going out, and there's no turn, so that, um, 
didn't come into the equation, but this did. Looking towards the good heavens the other day down in Kent, our cameraman espied a remarkable aerial ropeway. It's used for conveying coal direct from a colliery to Dover Harbour. And here are the buckets passing the central powerhouse that drives the whole system. Each bucket carries nearly a tonne, and there are about 600 buckets on the move. 120 tonnes of coal can be transported every hour. The ropeway is nearing the cliff edge. After doing a steady four and a half miles an hour over the cliffs, the procession of loaded buckets enters a quarter mile tunnel from which it emerges in Dover Harbour. The end of the ropeway is actually on Dover Pier. There the buckets are automatically emptied into huge bunkers and given a friendly push-off on a return journey of seven and a half miles. Now that uh, coal came from Chilmerston Colliery and that was the uh, brainchild of um, uh, Richard Tilden Smith who owned Tilmanston Colliery at the time. And unfortunately he never saw it come into being because he, he dropped dead on the House of Common Steps in 1929 I think it was, just before that came in. That worked up to about 1938 and then it was taken down in about 47 and sold to India. So to this day and age it's still, it may still be running. But this is what East Kent was going to be like, because you can see there there's having power stations, there's Tilmanston Colliery, uh, briquettes, brickworks, iron ore mines, cement works, chalk pits, all going down into Dover Harbour in the bottom right hand corner there. So you can see the plans, it was going to be um, quite a large place. At that time and all, you had um, Colonel Stevenson who had, um, well, what was known as the East Kent Light Railway operating from uh, Shepherd's Well there and he was going to cover all the coal field right through. They even had um, a line there going across Manston by the aerodrome and uh, most of them was leading to Richborough because that's where they were going to um, ship, uh, ship the coal out. This um, shows you what uh, Richborough, I heard you mention about Richborough Castle early on, well this is what Richborough actually looked like. In 1919, it employed 20,000 men. There was a hell of a lot of men working there. It was the very first roll-on, roll-off ferry in Great Britain. And this is during the First World War, where they were shipping all the armaments out to the um, Somme and all around there. It was all going through Richborough. As I said, it was the first roll-on, roll-off ferry. And um, they was taking all the arm armaments out there and then bringing them back a bit later. This shows you what uh, we know as the Pfizer site. And you had the, um, the wharf along there with all the barges that are quite common in France. You got Stonner Lake there. And all these were the army uh, barracks emplacements. Here's one of the um, ships that uh, sailed across. You can see the actual engines, uh, the trains, on the, um, on the ferry ready to go out. Now, Ben Sanger Colliery, was started sinking in 1924 and actually closed on 25th of August 1989. The shaft depths were, number one shaft was 2,500 feet and number two was 2,700 feet. This one was 2,000, you can see it up there. Yeah. Um, they weren't the deepest. The deepest was the um, Snowdown Colliery that went over, and Tilmanston, that went over well, well over 3,000 feet. So you can see what depths that they were down at. This is a sort of um, seam section at Betsanga. You had 14 seams, and we, um, we worked the number seven seam up until 1960, and then because uh, we had problems controlling the roof and selling the coal, we went into what we called the 1900 seam, the number six seam, and that was working right to the very end. And uh, that proved very, very profitable, that particular seam. Now, a lot of you may be interested because this is the number six seam, the layout, and um, you can see where over, press this right, over there is Eastry, that's Sandwich up there, you've got Woodensborough there, and these are all the coal faces going towards Worth, that's Worth there, you've got Deal in the bottom corner here, 
And so that's all the golf links and everything there. The number of people that tell me, oh yeah, we worked under the sea. None of the pits went under the sea. The closest we went to there would be St. George, um, the uh, Royal Singapore's Golf Club. So that is the sort of um, area that we covered. And you can imagine that um, that distance there would be about four miles. That was the pit bottom there. So we had to get men and materials in and coal out all that distance all the way through. We had underground locomotives just like they've got on um, the London Underground. Uh, at the end, we were all more or less computer controlled. It uh, was a very, very modern pit when we finished. During the war, Betsango got hit about four times. On this particular instance, there was two men killed. And uh, there was, I think it was 600 men trapped underground for 24 hours. But they did uh, get them out in the end. And also, they transferred the men to the other pits to keep working. But they did have a skeleton staff that actually carried on working with no ventilation during that time. Right, the community. Like I said, that um, the uh, Abercrombie wanted the communities away from the pit. Well, in particular, Betsanga. This is the Mill Hill community, which um, was uh, well part of the setup. Now we had a welfare a welfare organisation. Every um, colliery had a welfare organisation for the well for past sports and pastimes for the pit. Now, Bet Sanger were the biggest in the country. It's all right if you belong to a particular club, and you know what problems you have running that particular club, be it the bowls, cricket, gardening. You think of this, when we run all them, and there's a man sat over there, who was the secretary, and he had all this under his control, and believe you me, it was no easy thing, because when you go through that lot, and everyone's got their own ideas, thinking someone else is doing better than them, that, uh, but we were the strongest and uh, we used to operate all over Kent with our rugby, cricket, bowls, football. We used to go even on the continent. It, uh, this actually is uh, snow down and you can see the headgear in the background and uh, this is played on their welfare ground. Then you've got the brass bands. Every colliery in Kent had a brass band. This was um, taken on the centenary when it was in St George's uh, Church. They um, did a concert there. This is Snowdown Mail Voice Choir. Both of them bands and the choir are still operating to this day, although they're getting older with the Snowdown Choir and looking for new members all the time. They've even got a woman's choir now that's quite successful, so still carrying on now. This is the new complex up the hill. I don't know whether any of you have been there, but um, in Mill Hill we've got 15 acres of uh, ground, we call it the welfare ground, where we used to play rugby. We play cricket, soccer, and this is the um, bowls. And that long building in the background, that is uh, four rings of indoor, the latest modern bowls you can get. So you're quite welcome any time to go up there and have a look. It's, uh, it's our best kept secret, I think, so far, because everyone keeps saying, I never knew this existed. Each of the uh, collieries had their own football team, which was, uh, when they played one another, it was quite uh, a thing. They had their own uh, galas, where they had uh, things like the tug of war team, which was uh, quite a prestigious event. We had a fantastic first aid team. Um, that is the bowl for the national that they won. These chaps were really top of their job. In fact, um, one of the blo blokes there is um, Oscar Spears, who was a town mayor. So these, uh, these chaps were brilliant at uh, what they were doing. Well, they had to be by um, virtue of uh, the accidents that we were having at the pit. This is running again. <laughs> Coal dust filled wounds to leave blue scars for life. 
and clogged the miners' lungs. Few underground workers ended their working lives. It's supposed to be a movie, but it's uh, yeah. not begin. But uh, now, Beth Sanger Colliery worked from uh, 1924 to 1989, and we had a total of 68 miners who lost their lives in Beth Sanger alone. Um, that is uh, part of it is on that um, waiting miners' statue because we built that as a we had that as a memorial. Mining communities had a tradition of looking after the young and the old. We, um, we used to take, personally take um, the retired miners out on outings uh, during the summer and in the winter used to put cabarets on there and then go back to their houses with them afterwards just to make sure everything was okay, that um, there'd been no problems while they was away. We even looked after the kiddies, the kiddie sports. That was a real highlight of the... Uh, there you can see all these children enjoying themselves there. Churches, we were quite religious people. They had the amount of uh, churches that we had um, in Mill Hill. We still have most of them in here. So uh, there were six covering that area. Now, one that um, I come to quite important is Our Ladies, because they were very, very important to the um, mining community. Because when they came here, a lot of them, and I had never understood the word, but they were in service. And uh, I soon found out later what it was. They were in the big houses where my mother in particular was in Western Supermare, came from the valleys at 12 year old, and they were put in as domestic servants, and it was like slavery. And when they got to about 17, then they were sent back to the um, industrial areas and the valleys and whatnot. But that's how they were working. 20, more or less 24 hours a day. And with them, no pit head baths, then the men would come home and the women used to have to uh, dry the clothes because they were mainly soaked with sweat. So that is the sort of thing that um, when they... When uh, sons arrived back from work, the women were expected to have hot food on the table and hot water to wash in. This was further complicated if the men in the house worked different shifts. If you had a, please ex explaining where the women's job was about 24/7 because they'd get up for the day shift, see the night shift home, afternoon shift going, day shift home, and then afternoon shift home and night shift. So um, in my family alone, there was uh, four of us uh, at the pit, and so my mother was on the go constantly. These were up until the 50s. These were the um, women, mainly in Lancashire, working on the pit surface, because in 1842 they passed a law where no women or children under 10 could work underground. And they used to have the screens, and that's a terrible job that was. Now this is a particular Miller family, it's uh, Woodcocks, and uh, there was old Harry Woodcock and his wife, and um, the six sons, who all worked at uh, Bet's Hangar, and all on different ships, so you can imagine Mrs. Woodcock had a hell of a lot to put up with. And then we had the days before the National Health. Some employers ran health insurance schemes that did extend cover to dependent wives and children. The job that Janet Dunn's father had found was in the newly developed Kent Coalfield, and it came with a tight house and health insurance for the whole family. The benefit, of course, would mean that if you become ill, and my sister who broke her arm and another sister who dislocated her shoulder and so on, things that happened, uh, you would be taken into Canterbury Hospital, and that covered that. And also, I suppose, it paid for the local doctor. But the benefits for Janet's family would be short-lived. Working conditions in the mines were notoriously tough. The Kent coal fields were very, very deep and hot, and the men used to describe it as Dante's Inferno. It was really dreadful. A lot of people who came uh, only had to, did the one shift, and they collapsed and were brought out, and didn't go back again. The harsh conditions meant that disputes were common, and Janet's father was sacked after going on strike. The family was evicted, 
and their entitlement to health insurance soon ran out. Her parents had to find other ways to manage. Dad was wonderful in his little remedies. I remember my little brother, John, when he was very ill, and Dad used to go to the pub and bring a little miniature of brandy back and put a little teaspoonful in with a white of an egg and some sugar. And we were all fascinated with this. We said, well, that smells lovely, it looks lovely. And he used to just spoon this gently to little John. But Janet's mother became seriously ill during another pregnancy. And it was then that the consequences really hit home. Mother had um, preeclampsia. It's a very serious complication of pregnancy. So mum expected, of course, to be taken into Canterbury Hospital. And uh, she was amazed when they, they said, oh no, you don't go to Canterbury Hospital. She said, why? And they said, well, your husband doesn't pay to Canterbury Hospital now. Because he's unemployed, you're not paying. So you have to go to Etchin Hill to what was, called, was really the poorhouse. And she said, well, after a few weeks, I won't go. She did refuse to go. Dad and I, between us, we, we nursed her and looked after her. She came through, but the baby was uh, stillborn. The hard economic circumstances that Janet's family found themselves in were by no means uncommon. Britain was experiencing the worst depression of its industrial history. Unemployment reached 25% and many people found themselves in and out of work with little warning. So that gives you an idea what it was, um, well, some would know before the uh, national health. The women were great supporters of the men when there were disputes on where they would um, go. This is when 140 was, 160 has got uh, laid off and they used to help with the soup kitchens. They also used to get involved when any of our local clubs in our welfare had a, um, a presentation evening or something and they would all stand in as waitresses so they would all be heavily involved within the community. It's like uh, Malcolm Pitt said on, uh, with the uh, attitude of the people, and the communities grew inwards and they were self-supporting. Um, that's one, that's actually my mother doing our rugby shirts in uh, <laughs> when we used to run about four or five rugby teams. So, some miners got involved in local politics. We had um, the first lady on there was a chap called George Daughtry. Haven't got his uh, photo yet. Also included um, was uh, the bloke, uh, the manager's clerk was Eric Ferris. He was a, uh, a mayor. Then Oscar Spears was. And uh, finally, Roy Toe. They were chaps who were actually employed at the colliery and then uh, they were involved in the um, pit. So that's uh, the end of the first <laughs> for, uh, talk where I'll split it. I'll be invited back then, I will, but uh, anyway, thank you very much. Yes, I, I'd heard that, yes. Thank yes, you. that is true. Over here. 
Anyway, they were getting a bit fed up, and they seen that Lady Northwood was advertising for two footmen. So they thought they'd apply. So they turned up there, said, right, I'll interview you, and ask them their name, age, how long they'd worked, and then certain other questions. Anyway, he came, she said, well, look, she said, um, we'll be at the House of Lords, and you'll be expected to wear a kilt. So she said, you've got the job. You know, but I've just got to check a few things. So she said, um, so when you're wearing this kilt, uh, have a look at your knees and all that. So look at it, yeah, that's perfect. And then she said, will you show me your credentials? Well, if Tim had been that sick, they would have got that job. <laughs> Thank you.